Welcome to you all. Also on behalf of Thrive Institute for another evening of celebratory, uh, well, celebrations of our book launch, Thrive. Um, we're particularly sad because we don't have an audience tonight. So we're just here with a couple of guests, but we'll make the best of it. Please send us all your questions through, um, what was it? Not Menti, but mm -hmm. I think the Zoom page, yeah. Um, so we know we can interact together with you and uh, we feel your presence right here. Um, so tonight on the agenda, ah, one, one other thing. I'm alone here hosting without Case and we should say, um, Case, um, be well. He's very ill, so he couldn't be here tonight, but we're thinking about you. And you'll be here in spirit. <laughs> do drop us some questions if you do have some. So we'll be in touch a little bit. Um, so the second edition of our celebrations, uh, we'll be talking about degrowth. And we're very, very happy to have a beautiful bunch of guests here tonight. Uh, two professors and two entrepreneurs to be telling us a little bit more about um, what degrowth is and uh, how to go about it in their entrepreneurship. Then we'll also have a very special appearance of a artist uh, who works with degrowth. So um, let's see, we included degrowth in our book because we consider it fundamental as um, it challenges us uh, in its thinking uh, of what is radically important. Uh, we've already talked about uh, setting life center at, at the center of economics, and I think degrowth is a beautiful framework to, to be discussing what is truly important in life and thus be important in economics. So let's um, talk with Egbert Dommerhuis. Dommerhold, I'm sorry. No, no problem. <laughs> we have a beautiful bunch of names along with these beautiful guests. And Krelis Rabbold, thank you so much for being here. Um, Egbert, you're the first degrowth professor in the Netherlands, or should I use the formal term of bio-based business valorization? I'm like the first one there. Degrowth lecture. <laughs> Let's use that one then. Um, so, so could you explain to us, what is degrowth? Well, basically, in a few words, uh, degrowth is about um, the quality of life rather than the quantity of consumption. And it's very much, I'm an economist, and from an economic point of view, it's very much about um, needs, satisfying needs rather than wants. Yeah. So in a few words. Yeah. And how do you, how do you teach your students about that? How do you go about that? Um, well, it's not part of the curriculum yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do guest lecture, mm -hmm. and um, and students um, they respond quite differently, I must say, because um, you shouldn't forget that most of our students are trained still I in very much um, in let's say old school economics, yeah, and hearing something about degrowth, uh, that um, satisfying needs instead of wants, and um, and putting society first instead of shareholders, I mean, that is a completely new paradigm. And they really need to <laughs> get used to that idea. So some of them are also very much looking at me saying, are you serious? Eh? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I said, yes, I'm quite serious. I mean, uh, but this is not realistic, is it? I said, yes, it is. I mean, it, we can't realize it overnight, but it is absolutely realistic. Just a very completely different perspective. Completely different yeah. perspective. Yeah. 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 But very, very compelling, but also very challenging. Mm -hmm. I think I've, I've been an economist now for, well, 40 years almost. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the most, not only the most compelling time of my professional life, but also the most challenging one, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'll get to you, Krelis, in a little bit, because I'd like to hear your perspective as well. But I'm just re really very curious. How do you get uh, students in such a mindset that they're willing to let go of 40 years of economics <laughs> um, and, and think openly about what is really important? Um, I think w what, what I do and, and, uh, is um, I just create, or I create a context for them. And what I show them, I always start out with the IPAD formula. I mm -hmm. mean, it's very, well, famous. Uh, yeah. Impact is population times affluence times 
technology. That's what I always start out with. And what I always end up with is that economics is a very, very highly existential science. And that our behavior also has a very, very important behavioral and existential connotation. Yeah. And once that you know that your behavior matters, that, um, that your shopping behavior um, affects people on the other side of the planet, I mean, then you, you capture them. And saying, well, you shouldn't do this, or degrowth is, well, a new paradigm is much more interesting than the one we have. I mm. mean, it doesn't really work. So you need to also make it clear to them that it's really also that it is compelling, but it is also uh, challenging to work on. Yeah. Yeah. Really, absolutely challenging. Yeah, yeah. Well, that must excite them to Th be working on. That is that 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 is, and, and that's also why we developed a kind of a new, um, yeah. Well, it's not really new, but we have called it a new form of of, of uh, working with uh, with uh, with students yeah. and um, but also with other participants is well a form of diecasting. Yeah. Okay. Well. Put yourself in 2050. What do you see? What yeah. is your desired future? Yeah. And then start thinking backwards. Yeah. And then what do you need? But uh, beware, it you have to um, meet a few um, well requirements. Yeah. And the first one is that um, needs should be um, satisfied uh, more than uh, once, and that you also have to take the planetary boundaries into ca into account. And you get a completely different type of business model. Yep. And that is really challenging. Mm -hmm. And what they didn't come up with. And um, and that's also why I'm not, uh, well, I'm not only, well, let's put it this way. What I very much favor is kind of a, is a transdisciplinary approach. Mm -hmm. So not only students and not only lecturers, but al also not only businesses, but basically all type of citizens, all kinds of citizens, whatever the societal position is, yeah. that do want to or can contribute to the wicked problems that we're currently facing. Mm. And that is, well, that is basically one large explosion. Yeah. Yeah. Really wonderful. challenging, really nice. Thanks so much. For now, we'll get back to you okay. in a little wonderful. bit. Kalis, uh, assistant Thanks. professor at um, the Environmental Geography and Development Studies at um, the, the University of Amsterdam. Um, you're also the founder of Ontgroei, which is the Dutch word for degrowth. Uh, what's your view on degrowth? Oh yeah, big question. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, about uh, about definitions. I think th the first thing to say is that there are um, uh, an incredible number of possible definitions, mm -hmm. um, and I think everyone who would try to put a down a definition w then you would have yeah, a, a whole number of definitions that are very different. So I can I can give one, but uh, with the disclaimer that there are many. Which one like do um, you like to use yourself? I use so the basic one that that I use in class to start the class. Mm -hmm. So I also have a degrowth course at the UFA, um, an introduction to degrowth, and we explore from all these different perspectives that come together in the degrowth thinking. So then you get to a much richer understanding than just the definition that you start off with at the beginning. But the starting definition is uh, a deliberate downscaling of overproduction and overconsumption to enhance or improve the human and non-human quality of life or well-being, if you want to put it that, like that. So, so say that once One more, more time. For the people <laughs> at home. <laughs> so it's a deliberate downscaling. So yes. it's not an economic crisis. You know, very important. Very yeah. important. Deliberate. We want it because it uh, takes us to something much better. Yeah. Um, downscaling or degrowth downscaling of overproduction and overconsumption. So it's overconsumption. It's not, you know, people in Bangladesh and uh, Nigeria, they are allowed to imp increase their standard of material standards of living. They're allowed to grow, fine. You know, we're not, uh, that's a common misunderstanding, critique of degrowth. It's not at all about um, stopping, you know, the material standards of living of the poor to grow. So it's a, a deliberate downscaling of overconsumption and overproduction, focusing on that. Mm -hmm. And human and non-human to recognize that, uh, you know, this interconnection of, uh, of us and our, our um, ecosystem, our, you know, niche or our habitat as human beings where we are, that it's a sort of something that you can't see as something separate. Um, that we just take our resources from and dump our waste back in, yeah. but that we are interconnected in all sorts of ways. Mm -hmm. How do your students uh, react 
Uh, it's very you. diverse. It's an elective course, so it, I have students from all over the, the, the university. Mm -hmm. um, I have also economics students, uh, and there too, it's very mixed, the response. Uh, some students are already uh, have already made a few steps towards this kind of thinking, and uh, and others start. Uh, others, uh, I had a student that that uh, that said, I I saw the t the word degrowth, and I thought, what what is this? You know, I never came across this term. It's all about growth, growth, growth in yeah. my mm -hmm. uh, in my degree. So it was just curiosity that said, okay, I want to do this course. And to be honest, I also have a lot of students that are following uh, a minor that is uh, on sustainability within the Faculty of Economics. So they, they, they choose the minor, but if they choose the minor, they are forced to come and follow my course. <laughs> 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 but that's a small group. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, yeah. And you're also the co-founder of uh, Ontgroei? Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit more about what Ontgroei does? Um, um, it's, uh, it's very recent. A couple of years, and we've been uh, very active now in the last uh, year uh, to to um, or help organize the degrowth conference in the Hague. That was uh, there last summer, so that took a lot of our time. And before that, we were um, you know organizing events or talks and things like that. And um, but the idea is it's is much bigger. Um, we are I think now in a moment where there's a lot of momentum also with the conference. We had a lot of volunteers and many people who were very happy and actively involved in this you know there was a lot of enthusiasm and we want to m to mobilize that and to keep that to keep that going so we're trying to uh, to to see different ways of doing that to um, to 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 build the degrowth movement which is uh, you know taking it out of academia and mm. uh, to think about what is uh, what is happening on the ground in these different practices so I would say there is a lot already going on in practice, and it's a matter yeah. of, of showing it and of uh, connecting those. Um, and that's also, for me as a scientist or as an academic, very interesting to observe and understand. Mm -hmm. So I, I like that. I like being involved in that movement or in the beginning of that movement. It's also very exciting because it's a new movement in the Netherlands. It's an old movement in other countries, yeah. degrowth. It's quite new in the Netherlands. Are so you the first? Well, we looked around, you know, we went to a conference a few years ago with a few friends when we were wondering, is there something like a group of, on, like a degrowth movement group yeah. in the Netherlands? And we looked around, we asked a few people who had published a little bit on, on various blogs and they said, no, there is none. And then we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, but everybody was very um, supportive. We said, no, we need that. Yeah. And then at that conference, we stood up a few times and said, are you from the Netherlands? Do you want to to come and then we organize a few meetings and uh, and that's how it started and uh and what can we expect for next year um <laughs> good question <laughs> we we um we this is the thing with uh, I, I don't know mm -hmm. a lot about movement building it's uh -huh. going to be very interesting uh, to be part of it but we have a lot of people that do that have thought about this quite a lot and worked in different movements social movements and uh, i expect that uh, or what i hope what i wish is that we we uh, we first of all now it's it's quite the academics are quite dominant in the group and not dominant but quite present and you know there's a lot of us. Do you hear that uh, effort? <laughs> and uh, we want uh, we want it to be much broader. So we we hope that we'll get a lot of people from all sorts of different uh, um, you know practices and activists and artists and mm -hmm. uh, to to help think about how we actually do this right. So yep. we don't want to. This is a problem. Uh, and an advantage that degrowth doesn't want to have as a movement, I don't think, you know, a blueprint. This is what we need to do. Tuck, yep. tuck. Yep. You know, it has to be something that is uh, thought through together uh, with the people who are involved, especially because we have so many different perspectives uh, coming together, for example, at that conference. It's not a harmonious group. Everybody's agr agreeing and, and, you know, talking, uh, preaching to the choir and it's not like that at all. There's a, some basic understanding, you know, that a critique of growth and of the economic system that is driving growth and of the psychology and the culture that is driving all of that. So there's a strong critique that we agree on uh, and we agree that uh, it's a positive vision. It's something that, you know, that was said before. It's, it's something very exciting and beautiful that we envision. But the vision is still a bit vague. And we don't, uh, and and so we don't, because of all this diversity, we don't want 
we can't have a blueprint because we don't agree. You know, yep. people. Yep. Some people say, you know, the solution is here. No, no, solution is there. No, we need to inf influence policy. No, no, it has to be resistance and activism. Mm -hmm. No, no, it has to be. Uh, well, isn't it all of it all of the above? I think so. Yeah. yeah, and that's I think if you manage to do that, to keep that, and to not try to 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 force everyone in this uh, narrow vision of what needs to happen, then we have put potential uh, for something really exciting. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's a challenge, right? How do you keep that uh, that uh, common ground while also keeping that diversity and respecting uh, each other in the conversations? And I think that is, a, that is something I noticed at degrowth conferences. It's just a bunch of nice people, you know? Other conferences, academics are constantly fighting and no, I have, <laughs> you know, I'm, I know the truth. You know, I have this, I've published in, in this journal, so I know better than you and, you know? So th there's a lot of that sort of, fighting but at the, in these degrowth meetings my experience is it's just very there's a lot of care which is one of the principles that uh, that we hope you know that that people well it's quite befitting the domain voice. right yeah. it's it's the humbleness that is needed to be in wonder constantly of yeah. uh, so how to maneuver this new domain how do we create it i remember egbert uh, we were just chatting and you mentioned something about co-creation together with companies could you share a little bit about that yeah uh, what, what, what we actually discussed was uh, also the role of education in this field because um uh, what i see now uh, well how it is conventionally organized is that um at the, at the University of Applied Sciences, I mean, business takes um, um, is very, very central. Meaning that what, uh, in my case, I'm from an international business school. So business is very central, meaning that what they think the curriculum should look like is also implemented in our curricula. But now, uh, when looking at, for example, the circular economy to start with, or degrowth, even a step beyond that, uh, companies don't know. Even with, with, with something you could say simple as the circular economy, mainly, which is mainly technology driven and still very much also economics driven, companies find it very, very difficult to make that step. And now they're coming towards us, asking us what to do. So now the roles have changed a bit. So what I think is what we need to do is to find a middle way to collaborate and say, well, how then can we join forces uh, to learn, to learn from each other, so that we can better educate our students and turn them into even better professionals? Mm. And that is, I think, um, that's where uh, uh, we can play a huge and a challenging, but also a very exciting role as, edu as educators, because we are not a threat to anyone, any organization, any business, because we don't want to sell anything, we don't mm. ask anything from them, we simply want to collaborate, yep. and uh, and uh, and we have a lot of students at hand because they can do wonderful research for them, yep. and they really are eager, very much eager to also get the students on board. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think this is a wonderful new development. I'm very happy with that. Well, so co-creation. Uh, exactly, and it's a beautiful phenomenon in um, in systems change, right? The co-creation process. Uh, that's that's occurring right now. Could you tell us a little bit more about about what you have come up with? Because I think that a lot of people are very curious about what would be a degrowth business model, for example, which might be already a <coughs> contradiction <coughs> in terminus. <laughs> um, well, now that you mention it, I'm, I'm currently uh, writing a chapter of a book uh, on future of, econo of economy, and I was asked by a colleague to also write a book. So I also had to think about, gee, I mean, talking about degrowth, <laughs> and we have these, uh, as you already mentioned, we have all these uh, definitions and we have all these these concepts. But what exa exactly does that mean for for consumers, for government, and but also for business? So I tried to come up with a bit of a well, a kind of a layout. And what you then see is, I mean, degrowth, as as I uh, explained in, in 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 my view, just in a few words, is quality of life and the quantity of con and consumption. So looking at the quality of life, it's very much about uh, satisfying needs. Um, at the same time, looking at what uh, we're facing, what the planet is actually facing, we're churning out so many products, using so many resources, I mean, way beyond the carrying capacity of the planet. So we need to reduce our resource consumption as well as our energy, making sure not to go uh, beyond these planetary boundaries. So 
basically, if we now develop new products, they should be um, needs uh, oriented, aimed at satisfying needs, whilst at the same time not going beyond the planetary boundary. So, mm -hmm. preferably using less and less energy and less um, and less resources. Mm -hmm. And that is a challenge because basically what we're telling our, our companies to do is, um, well, you have to uh, reduce. And meaning reduce is churning out less products. So you have to create awareness amongst your consumers, mm -hmm. not perhaps not even to buy your stuff because they may not even need it. And that is something new. And that's also what triggers students. So, well, not, but what then are businesses for? I mean, businesses were always about churning out products, and, and now all of a sudden it's different. How do you answer that question? What yeah, are well businesses yeah, for yeah, well It is different. Yeah, but mm -hmm. if, if you then look at reality, I mean, this is what is actually needed. Mm -hmm. and w we can't keep on doing. I mean, there was also an, an article uh, just a couple of days ago in the NRC, in Dutch uh, new newspaper, also very much also um, contesting this idea of degrowth on false grounds. Which, which grounds? No, well, um, that basically the solution, um, uh, no, growth is not a problem. Growth is the solution mm -hmm. to all problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is very much from an old perspective, old e economic uh, um, paradigm thinking, because um, economic growth is kind of a panacea to almost everything. I mean, if we need money, growth. If we need health care to grow, growth. If we need pension funds, growth. It's all growth. And if we don't want to combat climate change, we need to grow. But, but there is a hugely paradoxical. How can you then grow, combating climate change, whilst at the same time, you're churning out ever more CO2 uh, emissions? I mean, that really doesn't work. Well, there's quite some people who believe that technology will solve that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you just uh, look at the, well, the studies and read what research has shown is, well, it's highly unlikely, highly unlikely. I mean, also a case, thank you, Case, for uh, sharing it with us. We also shared a link on, or, or on, on, on WhatsApp actually indicating that, um, that um, economic growth and climate uh, and CO2 emissions I mean, they correlate, uh, they correlate almost perfectly. Mm -hmm. Meaning, there is no uh, disconnection between the two. Yeah. And it's hugely difficult. I mean, if we really, if, if, if we have those people saying, well, we can, we can do that, to me, it sounds like wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. Because scientists have, well, tested models and different types of models. So, well, it's simply not going to, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can decouple relatively, in, in relative terms, meaning that we will become ever more resource efficient, but just curbing it completely, mm -hmm. not using resources anymore, and, mm -hmm. and not churning out CO2 emissions anymore, that is highly unlikely. That is absolutely wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Speaking of case, um, there's a... A compliment for you, Kralis. Mm. Kay says, what a wonderful definition, Kralis. Very <laughs> clear and clarifying. <laughs> so you. you can take that home with you. <laughs> Thanks, Kays. <laughs> um, he also has a question. What would be an effective percentage to degrowth, uh, uh, to degrow our Dutch economy? How much of our current economy is overproduction or overconsumption? Mm. Yeah, there's uh, uh, some papers coming out. Uh, and I'm also involved in a research project trying to to give this a little bit of, uh, to give us, to, to add some numbers to it. Um, so the easiest, I think, uh, way to think about it, uh, m maybe a lot of the listeners know about the donut economy, right? So, the, and there's a chapter also, no? I think. Um, anyway, so if there's If you the don't know about the donut <laughs> economy, <laughs> read, read our book. book. <laughs> <laughs> but so si very simply, you, the outer ring is the planetary boundaries that were just mentioned, we need to stay within. And then the inner ring of the donut, it's the social foundations, right, that we, yep. that we need. So there's a combination uh, here that, we, we, that uh, we realize that not only is one group, so it's not population as a whole. This is, I think, a very important critique from degrowth too. It's not 
population as a whole, there's, a, there's inequality, there's a distribution. It's one group, a smaller, relatively smaller percentage that is responsible for most of the emissions, for most of the material extraction. So when you talk about planetary boundaries, you know, overshooting, it's a, it's a, it's a small, relatively smaller group of part of the world population that's responsible for that. And then uh, the inner part of the donut is where there's a shortfall, where people uh, don't have enough uh, resources or access to resources to satisfy those most fundamental basic needs. And, um, and so degrowth, I, I would say, is a combination of justice. You know, there's this justice dimension too that uh, uh, I forgot that word in my definition. Um, it has to be that's just right, as well. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so simply put, you know, the the over, you know, those that are responsible for this overshooting of the planetary boundaries, they have to reduce, they have to shrink their, their th that pressure, yeah. and not only to respect the uh, planet's Earth system limits, but also to make space for um, those that don't have enough to increase their material standards of living, and to come now to the number. Uh, the estimates is that, uh, as a whole, the world would have to degrow by about 30-40% yeah. uh, of the current um, yeah, levels. Uh -huh. okay. so to do both. To s yeah, yeah. be safe for the from a planetary perspective yeah. and to be just. And just only the minimum, right? We're not talking about... So if you want to have Doing even better, a yeah. bit mm -hmm. more than the minimum, then yes. we probably need more degrowth. <laughs> uh, another question for you. Um, this one is by Emil. Um, how do you define the planetary boundary for your organization? You need to know where the ceiling is, but how do you define that and mm. on what scale? That's a very good question. Yeah. Um, I think, so there is this framework, the planetary boundaries, when there's nine planetary boundaries, you know, for climate, for biodiversity, for land use, for water, there's, there's a range. And uh, and there's uh, that's a long you know there's a lot of work behind it to try to estimate a safe distance from where there will be these radical changes in the ecological systems uh, that um, we won't be able to recover from right that uh, there'll be uh, so much deforestation that uh, that you know that that will change the local e ecosystems in such a way that the the forest can't come back yep. for example yep. so th those are called tipping points. So planetary boundaries are, are um, r it's risk estimate, you know, it's like how far are, we want to keep a safe distance from those moments in time when this could happen. Uh, so it's risk prob probability estimates. And then there are uh, uh, these hard limits to growth, which is at some point there's no more oil or, or uh, it's just too hard to get to the remaining oil on the ground or yeah. we are just taking out fish faster than they can come back. So there's a limit in the speed and how fast we harvest the fish and they come back. So these are s more hard limits that yeah. you can also discuss locally as well, the sort of limits when mm -hmm. the forest is gone <laughs> or mm -hmm. the fish are gone. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. so there's, there's, there's some research to be done. Yeah. yeah. But a useful, sorry, to just to summarize, I think a, a useful way to look at it is you have these hard physical limits, material limits mm -hmm. that you can think about, and the more that's called soft limits, like the planetary boundaries, which is about estimating risk and how we want to, you know, s keep the world within uh, 1.5 degrees to avoid uh, climate tipping points, and there's estimates there. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that, that Emil is referring to businesses as well, so I think this is part of, of uh, the answer that you gave is well, that we're figuring this out, right? Yeah. We're, we're trying to see how to create business models that are suitable with uh, degrowth strategies. Yeah. yeah. Okay, what, uh, ready for one more Do you want to add something? Yeah, it's just something that I, 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 I was sort of itching I wanted to say yeah. is that um, um, I think degrowth, uh, degrowth um, has to go beyond a focus on on overconsumption, that's why in my definition, I, s oh my, and I add, I added overproduction. Um, that I want, you know, let's say this, the, 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 the group of people that invest, right, that have, the, that own the financial wealth, the financial capital, they overconsume, right, then, but then at some mm. point, th th that's it, it's saturated, they've flown as much as they can, they have as many yachts as they can, and, and cars, but still they have all this money that they invest. Mm -hmm. So what do they invest in? You know, they invest in in a particular uh, in, in 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 profit making enterprises that want to extract some value or profit from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
because of this logic of all this competition in production, so even if the producers are themselves want to do it differently, they're caught in this system of competition. And it's, it's uh, even if they understand the problem, it's how can they step out of it without losing, you know, going bankrupt? So it's, a f it's a this constant struggle in the system. And then how do you stay afloat? You make profit, you increase your market share. How do you do that? By finding ways to co cut costs, right? So globally, you find places where labor is cheap or where there, there's no environmental standards or low environmental standards. So all these impacts on, on people and on, the, on nature are um, what's called externalized. You don't see them anymore. Mm -hmm. Of course, people see them somewhere. We don't see them here in the Netherlands. Um, so um, so it's, it's, it's also it's what we do with our money that we earn from our job and spend, you know, now it's almost into class and uh, Christmas is coming. So we spend all this, we consume. Yeah. But it's, I think there's much more going on, right? It's, uh, it's this enormous amount of money flowing around and in being invested in things that are harmful. And that needs to degrow too. <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. In I don't know how, or but, um, you know, that's the challenge. The how, how do we do that, Egbert? Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> if I just may also add to that, I mean, there is also very much a magical paradox to it because um, again, the number of millionaires and billionaires also in the Netherlands has grown. Mm. Uh, specifically, millionaires, billionaires uh, 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 on, on the globe has also increased. And there is a very much a paradoxical situation because we have a lot of people earning way more than they can ever spend. What they do is they, they invest it in shares. Um, churning out revenu um, uh, um, uh, well revenues and returns. These returns add to what they already have in excess. So in the end, they are only aggravating their own problem because they already had a lot. By investing, they even create more of what they don't need. So I am very much in favor of a very high tax rate, mm -hmm. up to 90% or something. Because, and you just also uh, mentioned inequality, if you look just in a, in a, in a country like, um, which is for us, it's kind of a wahala of, um, of, of, of economic growth, uh, the, uh, the United States of America, um, I think it's something like 0.1% of population owns 34% of the wealth, whereas 50% of the population, the poorest part of the population, only um, has 1.5% of the wealth, which is... I mean, it, when you come to think of that, it is, it's, like, it's really bizarre. It's really bizarre. And if you then also come to think of it, that's also something uh, Hickel, Jason Hickel uh, did research on. And an example I, I also very much favor is looking at a, a company like Costa Rica, for example. I mean, what we see is that um, life expectancy is higher than in the US. Um, the school system is better. And um, the care system is better, mm -hmm. yet they only uh, earn one third of what an average American earns. Mm -hmm. um, and that all has to do with inequality. And inequality actually also drives growth. And that is something we should also prevent. So we, I mean, we need to take also harsh measures here, also in our tax system. So higher tax rates on, uh, on wealth and on income yeah, I know it's may like swearing in church, <laughs> but uh, that's what we need. But also we need to have a different tax system also in terms of that we're taxing resources instead of labor. I, I would be really keen on hearing some of uh, the audience's questions about this. May I, I'm not sure, but I don't know if this uh, po of the if the population is representative of the people that you speak of. <laughs> no, but I maybe know. there there might be some questions about. This. I would really like to invite the audience no, to but react. I mean, this is not an ideological uh, talk. This is just uh, me talking uh, as a, as an economist, as a professional. Yeah. This is what I see. Yeah. And this, if we really want to uh, save this planet, this is simply what is needed. Yeah. And um, well, s some call me an idealist or. Uh, yeah, um, maybe, but but I think it's it's absolutely realistic. This is what this is the way that we need to go. Yeah, yeah. Well, I agree. Um, on that note. On that note. On that note, <laughs> uh, we should uh, switch seats. Really? Yes, it's already that time to move on to our next guest. We'll be seeing a l you a little bit later. I I hope. <laughs> for some more questions from the audience. So okay, wonderful. I'd like to thank you both uh, and like to invite Arne at the table. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Arna, I'll take this time to introduce you. Arna, you're an artist and an artistic researcher. Later on, if you would like, then please explain to us what that really means. I don't know, that just basically means that I take the freedom of an artist to research things that I find interesting. So, you know, I can my research can come out in any way. Could yeah. be a dance, could be a text, could be, you know, it's not, not that complicated. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for making stuff not that complicated. Yes, yes. Which is also very helpful. Uh, I believe you're uh, sharing with us a few stories. Yeah, just a few anecdotes. Yes. Yeah. Please go ahead. So I'm in the office of cancer researcher Hans Klevers because I'm interested in the fact that quite a few critical economists and degrowth economists and writers on alternative economic theory and so on use cancer as a metaphor to describe what they feel is happening in our economy. They say things like, economic growth is like a tumor. And it's true. Where we celebrate continuous growth in the economy, in the body it leads to death. But what if it's not a metaphor? What if cancer is the perfect model to describe the current economic situation? What if those hallmarks of cancer, the corruptive abilities that accumulate as healthy cells turn cancerous, the ability to corrupt growth suppressors, the ability for endless proliferation, the induction of inflammatory conditions, and so, and so on, are also the hallmarks of our economic system, then perhaps if we want to learn how to recreate a healthy system, we should talk to cancer researchers. So that's why I visited Hans Klevers, and he said something quite interesting about the difference between cancer researchers and economists. He said, I'm a relatively intelligent person, and I feel I have a good sense of what makes a cell turn cancerous, and I can speculate on what to do about it. But at the end of the day, I always have to return to that tiny, tiny cell to ask if what I'm thinking is correct. And that keeps me modest. I sometimes wonder if economists have such a point that they always have to return to, to check if what they presume is correct. That's what Hans Klaver said. Interesting question. Growth is very confusing. Even the word growth itself already messes with our brain. It originates from the proto-Germanic word grey, we can go to the next slide. Oh, I guess I turned them the other way around. Eh? So maybe we can go to the next, 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 next slide. Yeah, that's the one. Here we are. And then we go backward in time in a little while. <laughs> it originates from the Proto-Germanic word gray, which means something like the land turning green again in the springtime. The first shimmer of green leaves in the trees the first green glow of grass on the hills. It's a wonderful moment. It makes you happy. You want it to last forever, as does the economy. Growth is forced to eternally perform that first day of spring, like a broken record, because we are conditioned to think it makes us happy. But we, f we forget that in nature, spring turns into summer and summer into wi autumn and winter. Growth in nature is part of cyclical time. Perhaps it's the difference that makes us happy. So now we go back in time with the slides as well. <laughs> yes, here we are. So a few years ago, I exhibited some of my ideas concerning growth and shrinking in a large bank. And it was basically a collection of stories and thoughts printed on these big cardboards. And one of the images was that of a red arrow going up, red being a warning sign, and a green arrow going down. I wanted to send a warning that arrows going up, representing growth, are not always good, you know, in this shitty environment. I was trying to make space for another sentiment. So we opened the exhibition, and when I returned a few days later, somebody had turned the arrow around. Perhaps somebody thought I'd made a mistake. So anyway, I returned it back to the intended position. <laughs> Yet, the week after, it happened again. And so I turned it back again. And this continued throughout the nine months that I had this exhibition. 
all the time. Somebody was trying to send me a message. The bank was perhaps trying to send me a message. And I never found out who did it, and it's also not important, because I considered this to be an honest signal of the bank. They cannot allow an alternative to growth, because it just doesn't fit their business model. So not so long ago, there was a story about an Australian sheep that five years ago had managed to escape from the herd, free at last to roam the Victorian land, to eat when it wanted to eat, to exist according to its own essence. And the first year was great. And the second year was also very, very good. But in the third year, the sheep started to notice that something is wrong. It didn't feel so free anymore. Something was weighing it down. I guess the image already gives it away, but all right. <laughs> and this got worse in the fourth year. And in the fifth year, the sheep could barely walk because of the enormous amount of wool on its back that didn't shed as it normally would have because over the years, sheep were selected with a mutation in their DNA that don't allow them to shed their fur, which is, of course, very convenient if you want more wool, like people do. When the sheep thought it had escaped, it didn't realize it was carrying a prison of human desire inside of its genes. And it makes you wonder how far man's desire for more has already proliferated. Final story. So how can we reprogram this omnipresence of our obsession with growth? How can we start to change direction? Where do we find the pause, the space, the time to practice with making other choices? Oh, you can go, don't worry. A few years ago, I visited the Japanese island of Okinawa. And when I arrived at my hostel, a very small, very old, very elegant lady served me a bowl of miso soup so I could recover from my long journey. And as she placed the bowl in front of me, she said, Harahachibu. When I explained to her I didn't speak Japanese, she lifted her left arm and with the fingers of her right hand took one, two, three, four, five finger steps. And then she took a step back and she picked up this imaginary fifth step and presented it to me. And I reached out and she pushed, pushed that invisible step into the palm of my hand. Interesting situation. <laughs> but I still didn't quite understand what it was she was trying to tell me. Only later in my room, I found out that harahachibu is simply what people in Okinawa say at the beginning of a meal. It means eat until you're 80% full. So don't eat until you can eat no more, but eat until you're no longer hungry. And by the way, the people in Okinawa are convinced that this is why they live longer and healthier lives than most others. It's a, a well-known blue zone. Harahachibu is a simple advice not to push the limit, but to take a step back to create space made me think of basketball player James Harden, who is better than anybody at taking a step back. Rather than accelerate, he decelerates in order to create space. He takes a step back, and while the defender is still locked in his forward motion, Harden has all the time and all the space needed to do something creative, something disruptive, perhaps something beautiful. Five stories. I assume that more people are applauding for you at home. Thank you so much for your contribution to the degrowth You're welcome. movement. Um, Arne, what is your general invitation to your audience? I guess uh, don't be so afraid for to shrink. Don't be so afraid to, ta afraid to take a step back. There is wonders there. There's beauty there. There's creativity there. You know, I feel that as a society, we're basically with our head against the wall. Mm -hmm. And if you're with your head against the wall, you do, f you do funny things. You, 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 don't, you're you don't think straight, and also you don't ex experience any freedom to change. Mm -hmm. What um, do you mean you're, you're with your head against the wall? I think, well, you know, le like we're all, all the time talking about pushing those boundaries, pushing yeah. the planetary boundaries, all these kind of things. I think as a society uh, in the West, we are pushing those boundaries constantly, time-wise, pollution-wise, uh, the, the fact that we cannot consume enough to make us happy, all these kind of 
inner borders and outer borders. We're mm -hmm. sort of against the wall. Mm -hmm. And what you see a lot happening is that um, one of these current paradigms is innovation. So we'll find some way to break through that wall to experience again that space mm -hmm. so we can take a step, right? Yeah. But of course, like, like James Harden shows, the easiest way to, to create space for yourself is to take a step back. And when you take a step back from that wall, immediately you have perspective. Immediately you have the possibility to go left or right mm -hmm. or even take a further step back. So this is what I would like to invite people to, to explore, let's say, the possibility to take a step back, not to be so afraid of it, not to think that it's, there's no way that we can do it. Mm -hmm. I think there's lots of ways, and I think that even as we start doing it, immediately we'll have some breathing space, and we'll feel that creative sort of invitation sort of fill us. Mm -hmm. I'm quite, uh, because it, it's, just, it's just simple logic. You know? well, to me, your um, anecdotes, um, they reflect on human nature. Um, am I right in interpreting that in that way? Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, I think that them, yeah. there's, there's, a, there's an appeal to human nature right there. Yeah. That sufficiency or uh, thinking about enough yeah. is something that's inherent within us. Yeah, yeah. yeah I so think enough is a very important that? word. Yeah. And you know, and of course the system, because of the system, because of the, uh, the obsession with growth that you know, also in the bank uh, was apparent, um, th the system wants to constantly disrupt our notion of enough, mm -hmm. because otherwise growth might stop. So there are a lot of sort of m movements and, 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 and things going on that do not allow us to even for a moment consider if we do have enough or if, if we can take a step back. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, I think understanding this is also a creative challenge and a beautiful challenge and not just something that, you know, uh, yeah. and it can also, y you can also embrace the desire for less, to look for other types of uh, wants uh, and to, to be creative in looking for those ones. So I think that's basically, and I, I am, I'm very positive about people because, you know, just look around you. Uh, we are an amazing species, but we do have some <laughs> serious <laughs> issues. Yep. Uh, but we're also very good at tackling those issues. So I'm hopeful that if somehow, some, some way, the music changes, that we'll also have a different dance going on somehow. But of course, you know, and also uh, we, we basically also must. But must is never a good, uh, how do you say it, drive here, uh, incentive mm -hmm. to, 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 sed to seduce people. So uh, I rather invite and, 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 and um, I don't know. Um, try to find that inner desire for less that I, I believe everybody has. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody needs space. Yeah. I, I think it's beautiful um, to um, mention this as one of the main challenges towards degrowth. And I believe that Egbert also mentioned uh, needs and wants and how to make a distinction between both. Um, and what your work does to me, I'm a therapist too, so I, I know how difficult it is to overcome habits. So that the, the banging against a wall is, is, is how, even s if it's super uncomfortable, it's still the most comfortable thing to do because we know mm. how to do that. Mm. And it's, it's very difficult to recover that uh, essential feeling of, of sufficiency because it has something to do with our self-image, right? And it's, it's damaged in a way. Mm. Um, and your your uh, example of, of the, um, the cancer cells or cancer research, um, takes it a step further in how to fundamentally research um, how to recover what we need to recover mm. is health, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah mental health and, and, and physical health maybe in the end Exactly, well. yeah, which will lead true. to planetary health eventually, right? Exactly, yeah. If we, yeah. well. Yeah, we, sh we shouldn't forget that we are part of this living thing. We're not yeah. outside of this living. We are yeah. part of it. And, yeah. uh, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's our family. And uh, I don't know, there's lots of things we have to start understanding about ourselves still, but yes. Well, I another, another important phenomenon, I think, in, in the evolution of economics, I, I, I hope to talk a little bit later with our guests about that too, uh, is, is the family aspect. Is if we treat the living world as our family, as our relatives, then we start a new relationship with them, hmm. which will, we will form differently than when it, keeps, when it uh, is it externalized only. And we don't when we don't um, experience the damage that we are doing. Mm. Very important. Okay, thank you thank so you. much. Um, we'll do another change. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you in a little bit again. I hope um, for some questions from the audience. Uh, but for now, I'd like to invite the two women at the table. Two women entrepreneurs. Hello and good evening, Cecile van Oppen, founder of Copper Eight. 
and Melanie Riebeck, founder of Open Security and um, Non-Profit Ventures, I have to say it correctly. Welcome tonight. You're about to shed a light on how you implement degrowth into your entrepreneurship. We're really keen on hearing a little bit more about how your companies came about and, uh, and why so. Cecile, would you like to start? Copper 8. Copper 8, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, well, Copper 8 is, for lack of a better word, um, a consulting firm. Mm -hmm. uh, we are active in the transition to the circular economy, so a lot of what has just been said by the professors resonates a lot um, with what we do. Yeah. Uh, we help organizations in this transition, um, but we had two goals when we got started. One was to make as much impact as we possibly could, and the second was um, to really give the right example because I have worked in consulting all my working life and in my previous work I was increasingly frustrated by this idea that when the organizations grew that I was working in it became less personal um, we started to dilute the vision that we had in trying to make the world a better place because growth was something we had to sustain and I actually felt that we created less impact because of it um, so when we started Copperate nine years ago, we said uh, we also want to show, um, basically create a new benchmark for consulting firms to show how it can alternatively be done. Mm -hmm. um, how is that working out? It's working out fantastic. <laughs> we haven't grown very much. I <laughs> uh, no, we, we, you know, we had some pretty stiff limits. Um, so we said we never wanted to be more than 15 consultants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um we really wanted to set those boundaries for ourselves and uh, we haven't crossed that boundary um, and I think that we've only challenged ourselves to to sort of seek the boundaries in the transition make ourselves more intelligent make work more fun yeah um, but also take good care of the people that work mm -hmm. in our organization so also that you know the the sort of prosperity but we only work four days a week um, because we think it's really important that the people who work in our organization are happy mm -hmm. and have enough time to sort of relax. We work very hard four days a week. Yeah. W what um, would be your essential definition of degrowth? I, I have to be honest, I don't think we degrow as much as we don't grow. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that our definition is um, to, um, is to, maximize the impact that we create without growing in um, revenues in people um, maybe also in burdens yeah um, but the only thing we grow in but I hate the word growth everyone in my team knows that when I the GR word is like <laughs> development is what I like to call it um, is to, to grow in impact and to develop intellectually and to develop as a team um, but we don't have a growth ambition, mm -hmm. um, yeah. just in terms of impact. That well, we not, a, not a financial growth ambition. No. Yeah. No. Just in terms of impact and quality or maybe yes. even values that yeah. we could speak of. Thanks for now. Yes. Um, Melanie, could you speak a little bit more about coming about in your company? Sure. So, uh, so Radically Open Security is a uh, not-for-profit cybersecurity company. Uh, we have grown, I guess, <laughs> over the last uh, seven and a half years. You but, sigh uh, with that. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but I would say more as a uh, sort of as a side effect of trying to create a ha happy ecosystem <clears throat> uh, rather than that's really an objective for us. Well, what I think is far more interesting about Radically Open Security is that we donate uh, all of our non-reinvested profits to charity. Um, what basically means that uh, we have an odd business model called a fiscal fundraising institution. It's a kind of tax construction we got from the Dutch church. <laughs> um, sometimes a church wants to do something. Uh, and a commercial, they raise some money, and that money goes with a tax benefit back to the church. Um, we basically did the same thing, except that we made our... Uh, commercial spinoff, a security consultancy company, and we made our so-called church, the NLNet Foundation. 
Um, we are about to uh, close out uh, our book year for 2020, and we're making another donation uh, to NLNet. And uh, after this donation, we, we will have donated almost three quarter of a million euros uh, to the NLNet Foundation. And this is a uh, internet related charity that supports open source digital rights and everything for a better open and transparent internet. Mm -hmm. Um, the other uh, thing that I started was Nonprofit Ventures, which is a startup incubator for post-growth <laughs> uh, companies. Uh, what that means is uh, with, with both the words post-growth and degrowth, uh, they're nice images, but I actually prefer the word non-extractive mm. because uh, it, it's less abstract and I think it's actually more concrete <laughs> exactly what we mean. Uh, elaborate, please. Yeah. yeah. So I, I believe that uh, what I like to say is I think that financial extraction, uh, usury, <laughs> yeah. rent-seeking is the original sin of business. Okay. The original sin of business. Yes. <laughs> And, you know, I mean, and, and, and I, I use that word uh, deliberately yes. <laughs> because, of course, understand. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Please uh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I mean, usury, of course, also is a term that uh, comes about in almost every every major uh, world religion. And I like to ask the question, you know, what if business were a form of activism or a mixed media for art or a form of spirituality mm -hmm. or creative expression. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, but I think this financial extraction, this financial extraction, in other words, uh, taking money out of businesses to go to the 1%, this embeds the growth imperative. Yeah. <laughs> and economists uh, like Kate Rayworth, uh, for example, know very well to articulate uh, this fact that uh, there's so much extraction from our economy that it has to continue growing just to maintain a steady state. Yeah. So, but of course, a, a, an economy is a meta concept and it's composed of businesses, you know, but, but also nonprofits, government, consumers, educational institutions, all of us. Mm -hmm. Now, when we ask, you know, how do we create a degrowth economy or a post-growth economy that begs the question of how do we create a degrowth or a post-growth business? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? And I think the key is removing financial extraction from businesses. I think that uh, this very much has a lot to do with the entity structures and also the governance models uh, of businesses. And I'm a firm believer in nonprofit entity structures, yeah. uh, things like uh, uh, fa basically foundation-owned companies, but also I'm a, a large believer in steward ownership, uh, which also creates forms of businesses that are not meant to be sold. Yep. Because I think if you eliminate uh, the possibility for exits and yep. you also eliminate the possibility for uh, extractive dividend, then I think you're taking the profit motive out of business. Yep. And once you separate profit motive from the vehicle of an actual running business, yep. the only thing left is impact. Sounds good, right, Cecile? It sounds amazing. You yeah. just mentioned so, uh, one word, uh, two words, steward ownership. Uh, I know what it means, but please tell our audience what that means. Yeah. So uh, steward ownership is a form of what they would call self-ownership. Yeah. And what this means is it's a company that sort of is owned by itself. <laughs> Uh, I mentioned uh, sort of uh, foundation-owned companies. That's one very popular form of uh, self-ownership. In other words, a foundation owns 100% of the shares of the company. There are no other shareholders, which yep. means that this company is its own independent entity. There is no third party that can extract value from it, and there's also no third party that can tell it what to do. Yep. Um, similarly, with steward ownership, um, they talk about a number of things, include separating including separating profit rights from voting rights. But what I think is far more interesting about steward ownership in particular is their emphasis on creating companies that cannot be sold. Mm -hmm. uh, they use constructions, for example, so as what they would call uh, the golden share. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially, it's a, it's a kind of poison pill. In other words, you have a kind of veto, <laughs> vetoing share that is held uh, in many cases by the uh, Purpose Foundation, which is uh, in charge of uh, steward ownership uh, from Germany. Yeah. And they, with this one <coughs> veto, you know, vetoing share, they're, they're able to block the sale of a company. 
golden shares are not the only way to do this. You can also do this with uh, with boards of directors <laughs> uh, also uh, that are independently staffed. There's more than one way to do it. Yeah. But the point is that uh, the entire problem, I believe, with business uh, and certainly the contemporary problem that we have now with uh, trying to emu emulate Silicon Valley is that we use this basic construction of capital scale exit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think all three of these things need to be re-envisioned. Uh, with, with creating non-extractive businesses, I think you need three different elements. Mm -hmm. I think you need bootstrapping, mm -hmm. flat growth, mm -hmm. and non-extraction. <laughs> and I think that these entity forms and also steward ownership, this is what uh, eliminates actually both the uh, you know investment part uh, on the beginning to ensure companies yep. can bootstrap. Mm -hmm. It also removes the growth imperative, uh, <laughs> which is that flat growth part, but it also eliminates the possibility to exit. What that creates are companies where growth is not the objective, impact is. That's mm -hmm. not to say that they will not grow, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but it just says that growth is, is not the focus. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that, for that explanation. I think this is a beautiful way to overcome your allergy for uh, the, the GR word, right? The GR word. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a lot of inspiration here to, to be using in your... Could you respond to, to these ideas? I think it's really amazing, actually, because we were talking before the, the show started, and we actually do have a fairly traditional structure in that there are two sh shareholders, um, my business partner and myself. Um, I think that despite having a very traditional structure, we've actually, in our, um, you know, um, um, in our uh, opening sort of statement of the organization, actually ensured that we won't sell. Um, we've always said, you know, if, if one of us leaves the company, it just ceases to exist. Um, and I remember our notary saying, you're absolutely out of your mind. You know, you want to be able to sell this. And I know that our husbands have always said, oh, but at some point you'll just sell the company, right? And we're like, no, we're actually just going to stop at some point. We even said we'd stop after seven years, but we realized we were still necessary to push the transition further. Um, but we've always said, you know, if we're not necessary or if, or if we stop liking what we do, if one of those is zero, we'll stop cooperate. And we don't ever have an incentive to sell our shares because I think that it definitely creates this sort of perverse incentive to, to grow or, or create value. And you could even argue that in you know a person-based business such as Copperate, what is the value when we leave? I mean, I think we actually have a lot of value because our colleagues are super smart. But um, yeah, I think that just stopping is the fairest way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would like the colleagues who are part of us to also profit from the fact that at some point we stop and they will also get part of the money that is then in the company mm -hmm. to have a couple of months to think about what they want to do. D did you cast that in stone the moment that you would stop? Uh, well, we said we'd do that after seven years, mm -hmm. but we've now been around for almost nine. So, um, so explain. <laughs> so explain. Um, we, we, yeah, we had to redefine when do we stop. And we have these seven-year moments where we reevaluate, are we still necessary? Are we still liking what we do? But we actually do it more often than mm -hmm. every seven years. We, we pretty much do it twice a year. Okay. Wh which questions are those? L literally those two questions. Okay. Are we still having fun? Yeah. And are we still necessary to push the transition further? Yeah. And um, because part of our model is also very much focused on the propositions that we have, we actually put them down in paper, in books, in, in, in papers, so that all our competitors yeah. in the old economy, they would be called, yeah. could actually learn how we do things that we do. Um, that actually means that we're making ourselves obsolete in certain propositions that we had a couple of years ago. We're no longer doing them today. Yeah. It could be that at some point we have insufficient creativity to make ourselves necessary for the transition. Yeah. And if we reach that point, we will have to look each other in the eye and say, okay, maybe that was it. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is where copyright ends. Mm -hmm. Just to be clear about that, what is the, transi the transition? The transition to uh, you know, living within the planetary boundaries. Yep. You could call it the circular economy, but I think, um, as was already said by the previous speakers, I think the term is often misused. Yeah. So. Okay. So living within the planetary boundaries. Yes. Uh, beautiful mission still. What yes. would you advise other companies who are seeking ways to... Um, you will set up their businesses like, like, like you're illustrating right now? Well, the interesting thing, I think, is that a lot of people 
um, are curious when I talk about how, you know, our vision on the world and our vision on our own organization. Mm -hmm. um, but they always say, yeah, you know, you're so radical. You know, we're, we don't really have to confirm to that, do we? But I always want to sort of seek the boundary where we do actually challenge our clients to think about how to how would degrowth, what would it look like for you? Yeah. What would it look like for a large organization to degrow? Um, could you create a business model where um, the money you make isn't tied to the amount of extraction from the planet? Like, you know, servitization models, you know, product as a service. I, f I, I believe in the theory and actually it is um, accounting standards that make it very difficult for that model to also be an affordable model for the consumer and the business who puts you know, product as a service models in the market. Mm -hmm. I think we need to radically rethink the rules that govern our system um, in order to make um, it okay for businesses to run a degrowth model, mm -hmm. at least in terms to maybe do the absolute decoupling that was spoken about at this table. It's not currently possible. I think we can make it possible but we have to rethink the system and the economic rules that govern the system mm -hmm. in order to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and challenge them as well. Yes, and yeah. that is actually what we also do. We we make money in consulting, yeah. but we use the revenues or the margin from that to do research, practice-based research on how we can rethink the rules that govern our system. And in the end, we don't make a profit, but that's because we you know, put it into useful things that aren't asked by our clients but are necessary to push the transition forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's a question from the audience for you. Uh, from Noah, why wouldn't you sell your business to someone with the same values? I think that also has to do with um, the idea of selling. I think that Melanie voiced that very well. You know, what what is the value? If, if you're going to actually sell the business, that you would um, that means that there's a value in that mm -hmm. and if you're trying to sell it for more than what it's actually worth and I, I think you could even contest what it's actually worth at this point in time and if you then consecutively leave the company what is then left of that value um, so that is is one it's just I, do, I don't I don't believe that you can sell a person-based business and then leave and still have that value maintained because I think part of the value of our organization is the fact that we're radically changing the way we look at consulting. Mm -hmm. I think if there were two new people to run our company who would you know, sort of advocate growth, I think all the colleagues that we currently have would probably run away. <laughs> so what's left of it? There's no value there anymore. Um, and also I believe, because we have discussed the possibility of creating sort of a collaboration with like-minded consultancies in the past where we would create sort of one shareholder model. And I'm, I noticed that the way I trust my business partner, I don't have that with all the other people. I know that I, I can blindly trust her with everything I do because I know that our values are 100% aligned. Hmm. And that is because I actually worked with her five years prior to starting this company. Um, and I don't think that I would have that with everyone in an equal way. Mm -hmm. Sadly, I wish I could, but I think this sort of growth imperative is still so fundamental in so many people that, yeah, I guess I don't really trust that it would be in good hands. Mm -hmm. You want it, you want it to be taken care of properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I get that. Um, uh, let's see, for who is this question? Maybe for you, Melanie. How can organizations be targeted to actually join the process of degrowth? Um, is there some kind of behavior changing method that can be used, can, that can be used perhaps? I guess, how can we replicate your ideas into other organizations? Yeah. So first of all, I guess in this question, I sort of have to define what I think of degrowth <laughs> in, in order to tell how to apply that to companies. Um, when I think of degrowth, uh, I think of degrowth in the sense of the way uh, that Charles Eisenstein uh, defines it in his book, Sacred Economics. Mm -hmm. um, he talks very much about innovation and about how innovation is essentially the monetization of, well, essentially of the commons. And 
unpaid human relationships. <laughs> In other words, taking these things and, and changing that into the monetized economy. To me, degrowth is taking the monetized economy and converting that back into the commons and into non-monetized human relationships. Mm. So it doesn't necessarily mean that your company gets smaller, <laughs> but it's more uh, what you're actually accomplishing with this with the, with your company. So I believe very strongly in um, Yunus uh, social business. <laughs> uh, you know, Muhammad Yunus, of course, being the Nobel Prize winning economist from Bangladesh, he wrote a really excellent book called Building Social Business. Mm -hmm. And he defines social business as dividend free companies for solving human problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, social enterprise took that solving human problems and had uh, had a real party with it, uh, but the whole no dividend part kind of got left behind. Uh, so, <laughs> um, but but truthfully though, uh, it, with unis social business, there's two kinds. One is uh, type one social business, and this is uh, essentially a non-extractive business that fully reinvests in its profits into a social change vehicle mm -hmm. essentially yeah. so the the entire function of that uh, organization is to do accomplish something social yeah. a type two unis social business is cross subsidizing uh charity and then that also is the only dividend uh that's allowed out of the company and for the rest uh, of course the reinvested part is still uh, in building a social vehicle now i'm a great believer in this cross subsidization model uh, of course i also happen to be using this in radically open security <laughs> um but what i think is really great is uh you know i think innovation is overrated Right. Because when you get to a start, you know, a uh, startup incubator, they're going to tell you, be innovative, you know, find some new human relationship or some bit of the commons that you can monetize and let's let's make a company out of this. You know, I think we should do exactly the opposite. Well, is it innovation that is overrated or is it the need for inno innovation to be translated into monetary terms? No, but this is this is the way that we define innovation, <laughs> you know, in, in, in the start in the traditional startup ecosystem. Yeah. It's essentially find something new, monetize it, <laughs> you know, and, and this essentially is, uh, is, yeah. is, is basically innovation. Whereas I think what we actually really need is to take, you know, we don't need to try and build brand new markets. Instead, what we can do is take really well-known businesses extremely well established we know exactly what they do it could be cybersecurity. it could be consultancy it could be accountancy it could be law it could be you know anything that's just a, a well-established market where we know exactly how it works and essentially we can colonize that <laughs> with non-extractive companies and then we can take the you know the margins uh from selling those services and then use that to cross-subsidize activistic and charitable projects mm -hmm. <laughs> This is actually a really great selling proposition, you know, uh, and, and it's actually very difficult for commercial companies uh, to compete with because... H have you found uh, companies seeking your advice on this? Yes. And, and there are many... All the time, okay. yes. <laughs> yeah, and this is why I started uh, Nonprofit Ventures, um, because I had so many people asking me how I was doing what I was doing with Radically yeah. Open Security that I decided I wanted to help other founders in other areas, pretty much everything besides <laughs> cybersecurity, to be able to also create non-extractive companies yeah. in other areas. Mm -hmm. What are their biggest challenges, you think? Um, well, I mean, I think uh, getting started, running a company. <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, being a founder, it's, it's all great with these really big ideas. But at the end of the day, I mean, there's still the whole process of running a business. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's, it's hard. It's tiring. It's stressful. You need a community. You need people to talk with that don't think you're crazy. And that's the other thing. A lot of these founders who want to build non-extractive businesses, who don't feel like they fit into the Silicon Valley cookie cutter, yeah. you know, that is being pushed on us at every startup incubator. The problem is they feel like they are completely alone, you know? <laughs> and when I talk about, you know, are, are we sure investment is the best thing for us? Are we sure that we want to define success as the exit? You know, you can't go to an incubator. And I remember when I, you know, Radically Open Security was incubated, you know, in, in this case at uh, Amsterdam Center for Entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. ACE. You know, and I can remember, 
you know, I had to pitch, you know, at the end of that startup boot camp week and, 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 you know, pitch to a panel of impact investors. And some of the comments that I got, you know, <laughs> I mean, one of them basically said, you know, you're, you're either crazy or you're a genius. I don't know which one, <laughs> you know. And another one said, you know, you're not starting a company. You're starting a movement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> these were, I mean, th this was like the same month that I had founded my company. But, but these are the kinds of things. I was a complete b black sheep <laughs> in such an incubation environment. Yeah. But when we start talking about these concepts, what I hear from a lot of entrepreneurs is they say, you put words to what I can intuitively feel. As soon as we can start gathering groups of entrepreneurs who feel the same way, then we know that we're not alone. We know that we're not crazy anymore. And we can yep. start getting the community, getting the role models, getting the written up case studies, you know, for, for the business schools, you know, and we can take, you know, these isolated cases. And there's more than you would think, <laughs> you know, of, of nonprofit, non-extractive businesses. And we can start, you know, because one is a curiosity. I mean, 10 is, you know, sort of interesting. 100, hmm, that's you know starting to look substantial yeah. a thousand you've got a movement and that's the thing we need to start um putting the spotlight you know on the fact that there is a choice to be made <laughs> and also on the entrepreneurs that are brave enough to be doing this and i think gradually slowly organically we can start to build up a group of people who realize that Silicon Valley incubation is not the only way to start create startups and to realize that there's also a community of people who will support you in that journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you, have you linked already with uh, Egbert? I can see a uh, beautiful <laughs> corporation right there. <laughs> see science and business work together. Um, I'm sorry? <laughs> yeah, Egbert says he's all ears. Yeah, I can imagine that. Uh, well, it, it really it really befits the uh, co-creation process that we, we spoke about earlier, right? Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that. Uh, we still have some questions from the audience. Oh, by the way, I didn't get to get an answer, I believe, uh, 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 for the question. Uh, so how to target? You know, so these people, the, these companies, they come to you for advice. So how can yeah. we create a, a bigger movement that... How do we invite other companies to overthink, no, to rethink? Spread the word. Yeah. I mean, spread the ideas. Yeah. The thing is that most people, you know, they take a number of things as given. Yeah. Like the fact that we need more unicorns or that unicorns are somehow a good thing. Yeah. But when you realize, you know, that actually the situation is that, you know, our startup ecosystem is completely failing us. You know, nine out of every 10 startups fail. The one that doesn't fail is attempting to become a unicorn. And a unicorn is basically yeah. a indirectly taxpayer funded monopoly <laughs> that's being yeah. formed. Yeah. I mean, the fact that this is even being promoted by our government is actually completely crazy. But there's an echo chamber everywhere in the government, also in the business schools. That's changing <laughs> slowly, of course. Thank goodness it is. Yeah. But uh, the point is, once people hear these ideas, they can't unhear them. And I think that most people, it's not that they would disagree. It's just that they haven't had exposure to these ideas yet. And this is precisely the reason why we need, you know, the brave business school professors, <laughs> uh, you know, who, who can introduce these new ideas into the education. Yeah. Yeah. We need, you know, the artists, <laughs> you know, also like Arno to, to be putting, you know, these ideas like questioning growth or, or questioning if unicorns are good, you know, into the public consciousness. Because the more, I mean, not everyone's going to agree with us. But that's fine. We don't need to win over the skeptics. No. We just need to preach to our own choir. And that's enough because, you know, that's all we need to create, you know, the early adopters, the early role models. And it's the usual crossing the chasm. You know, we start with the early adopters, you know, then we uh, sort of slowly start uh, gaining speed, you know, and then at a certain point we get, you know, to the to the chasm, we sort of cross over the middle and then you start getting to the mainstream and then the laggards, and the laggards were never going to, you know, get them at first. They only come at the very, very end, <laughs> just so they won't be left behind after we've gotten everyone else along. So I think that's really what we need to do. I mean, preach to our own choir. <laughs> you know, I think we're doing that right now with uh, these kinds of events. And try and convince people who are curious about this, you know, 
get in contact. <laughs> you know, we right now are, are you know busy organizing for uh, Q1 of 2022 mm -hmm. our uh, post growth entrepreneurship incubator. <laughs> you know, and also for any related uh, movements like the degrowth movement or you know donut economics or whoever partner with us please because i mean i'm also really keen in uh you know helping to organize more business incubation events i mean how great would it be to have a degrowth incubator you know, <laughs> let's make it happen. How great would that be, Cecile? It'd be awesome. <laughs> I think it's I, I think it's missing. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because we are often. I mean, we have many entrepreneurs in our network, and they all think we're crazy. Like, why wouldn't you want to grow? Isn't you know when you grow, you create more impact? You're crazy. Why aren't you growing? Mm -hmm. So I think I think it's yeah, definitely necessary mm. to have a different sort of paradigm on being an entrepreneur. It isn't about being massive or growing or, you know, growing even in, in, in your own wages because that's also a question people ask me, oh, you've earned more over the past few years. I'm like, no, I've been earning the same thing since year two. Yeah. And I'm completely happy. Yeah. Yeah. I don't need anything else. I'm happy with what I do and I can buy my food what else do I need? Well, I think this is a beautiful uh, way of uh, illustrating what you just said, Melanie, about a company being, how did you say that, a space for expression? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, should we explain again what you mean by that, a space for expression? Because you're illustrating that to me, this is, this is um, you find fulfillment. Absolutely. As you as you as you run your business right now, and this this is one of the essential things about degrowth, I guess, is to to recapture what is fulfilling in life as a whole, and then also in our organizational structures. Yeah. Yeah, and I think to add to that, I think when we manage our company, um, I hate that word as well, um, <laughs> but the happiness of the people who are in our team yeah. is the most important aspect. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when we see that someone is unhappy, we actually talk to them about that. And sometimes that results in someone that we love dearly leaving the company because they're not happy. Mm. Doesn't mean we don't have a good relationship or that they don't love what we do. It just means that their happiness is in a different domain and that is okay. So it also means that you you create this ecosystem around your organization of people who are leaving the organization in a very sort of happy way, in a respectful way, mm. that we have this family of sort of former cooperators that are all still you know, part of our sort of extended reach. Mm -hmm. And I think that also, you know, there's so many sort of business principles of old business management that you rethink when you start to really build your organization in a different way. You know, it's not fear, it's trust that mm -hmm. is like the, the main driver. Yeah. Um, and happiness of the people. And, and that does create love within the organization in the end. So. It's wonderful. It's, and it makes everyone a lot happier in working. Yeah. Yeah. It's not work, it's yeah. sort of hobby we enjoy what we do yeah well on that note yeah thank you thank you both for being uh, for being at the table i can see it's already time to close um what you just said uh reminds me i haven't spoken about that we have co-created our chapter on degrowth together with Jorge Scalis, uh professor at acria in in uh, barcelona uh one of the phrases that he uses to illustrate degrowth is and it's not his, um, maybe it's, it's Gandhi's, I'm not really sure, but it's to live simply so others may simply live. And I love the simplicity of, of, that, of that phrase, uh, but also the depth of that, um, uh, of that phrase. Uh, thank you so much for giving your entrepreneurial perspectives on, uh, on how to um, give life to that. Um, so thank you so much for you at home uh, to be with us tonight 
uh, this was degrowth, thrive degrowth. Uh, the second uh, celebra celebratory um, session. We will have one more session to go, which is in about two weeks, and we'll be speaking about commoning. And we're really looking forward to seeing you there. Thank you so much for being here and thank for your questions. Thank you to the to the guests here in the um, beautiful Parijs de Zwijger. Thank you for the people at Parijs de Zwijger for making this possible. Hope to see you soon.